Looks like we've okay. got uh, 26 people on so far. People still jumping in here. People still jumping in. Um, so hopefully they'll catch up with us here, but let's go ahead and get rolling. All right. So uh, uh, today, thank you guys very much for taking the time to join us here, taking time out of your day. Hopefully we'll give you some, uh, some quality information on troubleshooting uh, an E1 error code. So uh, I'm Keith Clark, the National Training Director, and I've got here Daniel Hamrick. I'm the Director of Technical Support for uh, for GREE. Where are you coming from this morning, uh, Keith? So uh, I'm I'm based in St. Louis, and uh, out on the west side of uh, St. Louis in O'Fallon, Missouri. Oh, excellent! Is it cold out there? We had a little snow and all kind of melted off, so we're doing pretty good now. Um, didn't have to shovel or anything. It's good, good thing. <laughs> nice and chilly here in uh, sunny South Carolina <laughs> this morning, but no snow, no ice, none of that. Yep. Yep. It's not Florida, but you know, we'll get there someday, right? After That's a right. Certain age, after a certain age, it's the law, I think, right? So. Um, Welcome to the uh, Green Select Dealer webinar. Uh, again, if you have any questions as we go here, please just uh, type those questions in. We'll try to answer them as we go. Um, we may uh, uh, delay on a few of them, but uh, we will get you answers for all of them by the end of the presentation. So what we're gonna cover today is where to find help, confirming proper installation and operation, uh, troubleshooting test points, troubleshooting with test tools, and then we've got some tips and tricks uh, to share with you. So where to find help? Uh, we're gonna continue to put more information out on greecomfort.com. So please take a look out there. Just go to greecomfort.com. Under instructional videos and FAQs, we're gonna continue to upload uh, quick tip videos. We're gonna try and take these. This is a pretty comprehensive class today. But we're going to try and condense those down into a real quick two, three minute quick tip. Uh, so you can go out there when you're on the job, you can go to that quick tip, find a fast answer, hopefully get your customer up and running and uh, be off to the next job. So uh, make sure to look the, at the uh, informational videos and FAQs, go to quick tips and you'll find them there. You can also from greedcomfort.com go to system documentation and literature. We're going to continue to add updated literature to those as well. We're going to try and, and add improved uh, service manual. This will be uh, um, our own service manual that we create that has lots of information, uh, useful information, test points. Uh, if you're using a meter on something and you need to know which terminals to touch and what readings you should get, uh, we're going to try and put that information out there. Any helpful information that we can. Uh, we're, we're developing other uh, things as well, uh, working on a phone app and other things that can help you in the field. Uh, you've got to, a you've got a lot on your plate, Keith. <laughs> I do. I do. Busy guy. It, exciting, exciting news. I'm I'm glad to see that things are improving. Um, uh, and and by the way, I, I didn't know we had a website. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Been out there for a little while, a little while, but. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, please be sure to uh, keep an eye on that. Um, you know, it is going to be changing and there's hopefully going to be a lot more useful information for you guys out there. Um, so if you're not a GREE Select dealer, I know most of the people on here are, but uh, it's very easy to become a GREE Select dealer um, and uh, just attend a meeting and we'll get you signed up. And there's a lot of perks and benefits to uh, becoming a GREE Select dealer. Uh, extended warranties. Um, we put you on the website as a uh, as a potential source when customers in an area are looking for a, a good contractor that knows how to install these things. Uh, your name will be populated on there, and there's uh, lots of other uh, uh, benefits as well. So, excellent. What we're going to do today? We're going to go uh, to the skip to menu. Go to single zone. Uh, we're going to look at the Vireo Gen 3 mainly. We're, we're kind of focusing around that today uh, in what we're going to discuss. And what you'll find out there is under, under single zones or any of the other multi-zones, all the individual models, <clears throat> you'll find installation owner's manuals. 
service manuals, and these are all in PDF format. So they're good for printing, for downloading, um, uh, very useful for you out in the field. In the service manual, they show this E1 error code, um, you know, and they give you a brief description of possible causes. This is fairly light. Uh, they only have three items listed in here. Um, we're gonna talk about 11 different items today. Uh, and with these systems, it's just a matter of really understanding how the system operates and, and what things to check next. So uh, we're gonna look at um, the easy things first is the outdoor ambient temperature too high. Uh, are the service valves open fully? Do you have dirty filters, coils, or obstructions? Uh, is the stepper motor working properly? Indoor fan motor functioning properly, condenser motor, and so on. And uh, we're gonna touch on each of these and uh, hopefully give you a real good uh, troubleshooting method for finding, uh, for solving any one. We're also making new um, troubleshooting flow charts that are more robust than what you'll find in service manuals. And so this is some of the information that's gonna go out there uh, to the website, and hopefully we'll help you get these problems solved a lot faster. Um, we're gonna confirm proper installation and operation. So talking about being in the, uh, within the uh, operating temperature range, uh, we've got these all models listed on a chart here that will show you uh, some of the operate, all the operating temperature ranges for these different products in cooling and in heating. If you're in an area that's very cold, uh, you may want to consider migrating to something like the Vireo Gen 3, which has a much wider operating temperature range. Uh, if you're in Phoenix and uh, you know it gets really hot out there, you may want to uh, consider a Sapphire or, or some other model than you might be currently using if you're experiencing uh, any type of issues having to do with operating outside the... Uh, it, goes, it goes back to to uh, best practices, um, you know, choose the, the correct model for the application. Right, right. And if you need help with that, uh, we can certainly help you with that as well. We have, uh, you know, very well-schooled uh, sales force and uh, sales reps and, uh, and people that can help you out. Us and uh, technical can help you as well. So on this Vireo Gen 3, um, you know, one of the causes, potential causes, um, people will talk about a high pressure switch. Not all systems have high pressure switches. In fact, all of the mini split series have uh, just a temperature sensor, discharge temperature sensor. And the 18,000 BTU multi-zone also has just a discharge temperature sensor. So it's, um, it's actually a, a pressure reading or a temperature reading uh, being converted to a resistance value uh, that the that the main board is going to do calculations to determine whether or not to initiate that E1. So a few things to check. So checking all the easy things first, you can do a lot of visual inspections, um, save yourself hopefully a lot of time and trouble, but verify that there are no splices uh, or damage to the interconnecting cables. Uh, a splice or a fray in the interconnecting uh, cables can uh, even an improperly rated Cable can cause an E1 error. Uh, verify that all the panels on the equipment are tight and uh, tightly secured on there. Uh, those can throw off sensor readings as well. You know, the the, the frayed wire is, is something that uh, we questioned for a long time. And Richard did a lot of research and, and lab testing. And I've actually had several cases where I had um, a, a damaged wire and it was actually causing the E1 error code. Um, you gotta uh, keep in mind, Keith, that the the E1 error code is but a symptom. Um, you know, it, it could be a lot of different things and not just to mention uh, frayed or damaged uh, control cable or interconnecting cable, also grounding as well. I've had several instances with our friends up in uh, upstate New York where um, it's been a grounding issue that was it, sometimes causing E1, but also causing uh, some random other error codes to pop up for what appeared to be no reason. Right. Yeah, the uh, grounding can cause those random uh, uh, error codes and things. So it's always important to check that. Just make sure they're tight and secure. Um, let's see. 
and then um, moved to the service vows. Surprisingly enough, <laughs> uh, this does happen, uh, but are both service vows fully open? And, um, you know, there are two on there. Sometimes uh, uh, someone will neglect to open one of them, and that's going to cause a high-pressure situation uh, that can give you that E1. That's so, really easy to do on a multi-zone system where you've got two valves per indoor unit. So you got a bunch of valves that you have to make sure are opened all the way. Right, yeah, real good point. And, uh, and, and the other thing is uh, you don't have to wrench on these things uh, when you're backing them out. Um, back them out, you know, back them out gently. You don't have to put a, a cheater pipe on there to, uh, to get them open fully, but uh, back them out all the way and then just give them a little nudge back in and, um, and you should be good to go. We've actually, uh, uh, Richard in tech um, wrenched on those things just to see, you know, um, how how robust they were, what it would take, and he actually uh, cranked one of the valves all the way out. So it it's um, it's called a, a non back seating uh, valve is the term that uh, that Richard uh, it schooled me on the difference between the two. And um, some manufacturers will have a note that says. Uh, turn a quarter turn back in once you've backed it out um, yeah. just to make sure that it is um, it's not going to leak right right so uh, that's that that's a pretty important thing uh, you know hearing that there's a leak in a service valve it, you kind of scratch your head and it's, how, how could there if it's you know you always assume it's the connection but uh, cranking on those valves too hard can cause you a little problem so something as but, simple as that right but all, but also if you know the the brass to brass surface of the cap that goes on it, um, if you torque it down closed, it will seal um, anything that may be behind there. Right, right. So uh, the other common thing, this is probably the most common thing. Would you say, Daniel? Um, dirty filters, oh, certainly. Coils and uh, some kind of a blockage around the outdoor unit sometimes people don't like the way they look and they'll plant a hedge back there or something and uh that that's not a good mix so um you know test procedure for this visual obviously uh take a look at this condenser coil that is oh that's rough <laughs> that's pretty dirty and uh do you think that might cause an e1 error that that could cause an e1 keith <laughs> I, I would bet that, that would cause an e1 error pretty quick uh you know uh, certainly in cooling mode right and then we've got some dirty filters here. Those are those are pretty dirty. And if the filters are that dirty, you think the coil might be dirty? Oh, most certainly. I bet it probably is. Yep. So uh, once you clean these things too, you know, we would recommend start the system in turbo mode um, because if you power down, the E1 is going to clear. Um, and so if you restart, you know, restart in turbo mode, let it run as long as possible before you leave the job, because uh, if that E1 pops back up, then you're back out there on, on another callback, and uh, that's not good. Hopefully, this is a service call that you can charge for here. A uh, quick, how about a dirty blower wheel? A quick, um, Keith, real quick, a, yeah. a quick check. Uh, you're, you're mentioning, you know, reset the system, you know, pull the main power for five to ten minutes. Um, if it does clear the code, then you know it's likely something else besides uh, a failed pressure switch. Right, right. And uh, we're going to talk about it a little more, but the system will try to adjust. Uh, its desire is to keep running. And so it's going to slow down. And when it, when it sees some of those conditions, it has logic in there to try and keep it running as long as possible. Yes. Um, but dirty filters, coils, uh, dirty blower wheel. I've seen this a lot. Yeah. The yep. filter, the filter's clean. The coil appears to be clean. Take your flashlight and shine it up in through the louver and you'll see that the, the blower wheel has some buildup on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be pet hair. It could be a number of different things. And, and probably particularly in the, uh, the southern, more humid climates of that. Um, and there are some things that you can do um, to mitigate a situation like that, UV lights and, and some other things. But uh, that, that's an important thing to, uh, to check and fairly easy to clean. Well, like fairly easy to clean. Um, so what about a situation like this? Do you think that could cause a bad radiating environment? Oh, no, that, that, looks, that looks really pretty. I like how it's uh, concealed. 
<laughs> yeah, almost completely concealed. There is no airflow going across. No airflow at all. Yeah, and uh, so that one's throwing an E1. I can almost, I can almost guarantee it. Uh, and then situations like this as well. What do you see that might be problematic here? I hmm. think clearances. Is, yeah, clearances. This thing is pinned right up next to the house. That's pretty close. Um, I'd be surprised if it wasn't uh, causing any one. What's the so what's the sure. general what's the general clearance from the from the wall? Isn't it about twelve inches? Yeah, it's a foot, and yeah. uh, you know, which still is not much. Uh, it's it's better than a lot of conventional equipment. Um, but yeah, you got to get you got to get some airflow around that thing, and then even in the front, you know, there's uh, a big tree or bush growing out here mm -hmm. that's really causing that thing some some difficulty in getting rid the of it. landscapers may have just trimmed it um it you know it may have been even worse a, a few true. weeks ago <laughs> that's true yeah this guy just to get back in there probably cut some of that stuff out of there so uh, you know just just visual inspections uh take a look around uh there's probably some stuff you can clear out of there and definitely should how about this um you, you suppose that might cause a, a little bit of a problem <laughs> maybe um I, I would say that the the one in the front in cool yeah. mode is getting a, a little bit of a overload on heat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, you know, uh, use a little common sense when it comes to this stuff. Uh, also, you know, if you're in a snow condition, uh, you need to get these things up off the ground. Um, these are going to have a hard time. Uh, always consider the environment systems are being installed in. Uh, overcharging a system will produce higher pressures in heating mode. Um, pressure can reach 600 PSI before the system displays an E1. So these units should have been much higher off the ground to avoid snow buildup. Um, what other problems could this cause? And, that, and that's also local code, I believe. So be sure to follow your local code. Yep, yep. And... Uh, so other problems, um, you know, inability to defrost completely could lead to ice buildup. That ice buildup, you know, ice expands when it freezes, and then you might have leaks in coils and, uh, you know, all kinds Help of other fan problems. motors. Yep, yep, fan motors. Um, could a, a leak in a condenser coil cause an E1? If you're low on refrigerant. Most certainly. Yep, if you're low on refrigerant, um, the discharge pipe, I, you might not have enough cooling gas coming back to the compressor, and now your discharge temperature uh, coming off the compressor is high, and uh, that temperature sensor could, uh, could trip due could to that. Could trip the one. E1 code, yeah. Stepper motor, not a common uh, thing, and it's a very easy visual inspection. I mean, you can see if the louver is moving uh, if you come into the room and the louver's closed like this and it's in heating mode, could that cause an E1? Yes, most Absolutely. certainly. You know, I, I, I didn't even think about this when we were talking about the E1 code, Keith, and you brought this up and it's a very good point because it's not something, it's something that you would normally overlook. And I did. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a simple thing and uh, you can check it very easily by just hitting the swing button on the remote. And if it's, you know, if it's not moving, then you may have an issue with the stepper motor. Very easy to check. Uh, you know, and it's a good idea when you're out there to just check through some of these things and uh, uh, make sure that you aren't going to end up back out there. But um, stepper motor, the wiring terminals, uh, you know, the plug on the board is, is right down here at the bottom right, uh, typically. And to check it, uh, we've got some tables and charts and things, and these will all be out there on the website as well. Um, you know, look at the at the board uh, diagram, and it'll show you where these different components are, and then uh, very easy to test uh, with a with a simple ohms resistance test. And these are the values you should see across the wires. We'll put all this stuff out there um, so it's readily available to you. Uh, any questions coming in yet? Uh, not so far, Keith. Looks is like we're right? good. We're good we're for now. Just, we're going to have to start like typing our own questions <laughs> and stuff to get the ball rolling. But any questions that you guys have, please throw them out there. And uh, uh, we should be able to answer them for you. And uh, certainly by the end of the call, we're going to go through everything that you guys have on your mind. So 
uh, let us know if this is helpful uh, so far as well. We always want to do continuous improvement. So um, indoor fan motor. And uh, again, that should be a pretty easy thing to visually test, uh, see if the, if the indoor fan is running. Uh, if the indoor fan was stopped, uh, again, in heat mode, uh, probably going to throw you a new one. But you're probably going to get a call from a customer a lot sooner than that because there's no air flowing in there. So that should be pretty easy to uh, suss out. But, so there's an unpowered test, ohms resistance test. Um, tells you from white to red should be 240 ohms and, and so on. Again, here's the board diagram showing you where that uh, fan motor is located. And uh, the uh, sometimes, and, and I should mention this because they show it in there as the PG motor, PG mm -hmm. fan motor, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a pulse generating is what the PG stands for. Mm -hmm. Pulse generating uh, motor is your indoor fan. Um, so the powered test, this 230 volt model, <clears throat> while the indoor unit is running, uh, you can check brown to white and uh, on the different speeds, um, you know, you should see these different settings. Uh, obviously, if you go to turbo, then you know uh, what speed it's running at. Uh, visual test, outdoor fan motor. So outdoor fan motor also stopping running can cause you need one in cooling mode. Um, visual test is fairly easy, but also if you can spin the motor a little bit because, you know, maybe it's running, but it's bound up a little bit, um, you know, and spinning the, the fan blade by hand uh, can, can also, uh, a physical test that can let you know if the thing is operational or should be operational. Could the outdoor unit uh, fan motor stopping cause an E1? Yes. Right? Yes. Cool yes. mode. Uh, then uh, turn system on in turbo mode. Is the outdoor fan running? Uh, if so, the motor should be good. And um, if you need to do a powered test, this is the uh, terminal strip on the board. And you test terminals one and two. And... Uh, remove the harness from the board first, and then test these terminals one and two. You should have 280, 310 volts DC across there. Uh, you can also do uh, this power test across two and three, and you should read uh, 15 volts DC. And then there's also the harness test. And uh, just uh, uh, across any motor terminal shouldn't be less than one KO. Yeah. Um, just to, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, pull the, pull the Molex plug off of there, you know, to test, um, there's a retainer clip. If you see that the red piece there, that, that keeps you from pushing the plug, the clip that lets that, um, connector off of there. You'll notice oh. on the picture on the left oh, there. On the, yeah. Yeah. On the, motor. On, yeah. On the, on the Molex plug, the, right. the red clip that keeps yeah. you from taking it. So you remove the retainer clip. And then that Molex plug comes right off of there. It's oh. it. It gets frustrating when I'm on the phone and a contractor is going, "Man, this thing won't come off here. What's the deal?" It's yeah. the retainer clip. Well, we'll make sure to include that in the service manual. We'll show some yes. good pictures and uh, and show them exactly how to do that. And and in a quick tip video, right? That would be a that would be a good quick tip video. Yep. So troubleshooting test points. Blockages, restrictions, mismatch piping. Um, this is an actual picture that uh, we just came across. Uh, mm -hmm. for, yeah, for a, friend, North. a friend uh, in upstate New York sent that to me. Um, that's the bonnet from the flare nut uh, that it was left on and, and pushed its way out into the pipe. Yep. Well, I'm sure that wasn't any of the people on this call, um, but uh, <laughs> just in case, you know, if you've never seen that. And I've seen plastic, uh, sometimes a pipe will have a plastic insert in there. I've seen those in there as well and uh, yeah, all, yeah, all kinds of mayhem. Uh, but just make sure that the piping, uh, you know, you can perform a temperature differential check to ensure piping is clear and um, check for cross lines and piping. This is an actual case. Uh, you just ran across this recently, right, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. The um, so on on a multi-zone system, 
the uh, the circuit, the wiring was mismatched according to which indoor that it was going to. But not only that, the refrigerant piping was mismatched with the particular circuit that it was supposed to go to as well. So mm -hmm. it was not only confused about which indoor unit was calling for refrigerant to be metered to it, it was also sending it through the wrong pipe to a different indoor unit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that can be, uh, <laughs> that can <laughs> certainly cause a little confusion for the system trying to Very confusing. <laughs> uh, so a remedy for that, like, and I could see if somebody's hooking up a multi-zone system, they're going to shove a lot of pipes through the wall at once, right? But they should tape tape the sets together. You know, this is this is set A, set B, set C, whichever uh, set of valves you're going to go to on the on the system, and then same with wiring, right? Yeah, different colored electrical tape seems to be a a good idea. Um, yeah. You know, and that way you know this one's with this one, right? Yeah, because that, uh, that could certainly be problematic. So indoor circuit C, you said that the line, uh, you did a four-point temperature check. Yes, yes, a four-point temperature check. And I think we'll, we'll talk more about the four-point temperature check, but basically what you're doing, and, and this is, um, once we've rolled out all of the basics, uh, dirty coils and all the stuff we went over, um, all the visual checks, uh, this is a good check to see if there's a restriction anywhere. Um, right. And, and what the key was on, on the mismatch refrigerant lines going to the wrong ports was that the uh, temperature on one pipe compared to the other one was way different. Um, so the one that was calling and the one that wasn't calling, the one that wasn't calling was getting refrigerant to it when it shouldn't. Um, so you, you're seeing heat there in the heat mode. Right. And, and so, uh, like these bullets say down here, the EEV is located in the outdoor unit. So when you're testing those pipes on the indoor unit, the only thing that should change the temperature of the refrigerant between those two lines is the airflow across the coil. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's, that's usually about five degrees difference between the two pipes. Now, I'll tell you a secret that we've learned on the flex system is if if you if you think about where you hook up, uh, if you're familiar with the flex, you've got service ports indoor and out, um, so you can hook your gauges up at both places. But there's not a true suction port, so your pressures at that point are going to be close to the same on those two pipes in heat mode, about ten degrees difference, and you know you're in in a good spot. So that five that five degree difference and then that 10 degree difference, you know, good rule of thumb to see if there's a restriction somewhere that you need to, to look for. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, the fan blowing across the coil, the refrigerant's going to pick up heat. There is going to be some temperature difference, but it's not going to be 118 and 170. And, and let me clarify on the flex, it was PSI difference, not yeah. temperature difference on the mini splits. We're talking temperature difference, right? Yeah, because the flex system, it's an inverter split system, but it has uh, two sets of service, it has two service valves on each end, on the out, two service valves on the outdoor, two service valves on the indoor with ports to put gauges on, but it's still an inverter system, so it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not going to have pressures like a conventional. Uh, right. Right, anyway, right. We're getting off track a little bit, so we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get back on track. We've got a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. If you'd like to go over a few of them, Keith. Yeah. Um, Sam uh, Sam Brewer is asking, uh, does Gree make a pan heater for outdoor units in cold climates with condensate freeze up? Um, if you want to answer that, all, all Gree units come with a base pan heater installed. Yes, the, already every, installed. Every system comes with. A base pan Mo heater moving forward some of our previous models did not have um some had and some didn't have the base pan heater um like your your u-match uh a revision didn't have the base pan moving forward the the models do include the base pan heater um with all of our current models and then we've got another question uh from derek um I was told when the indoor motor goes out, you need to replace the indoor board as well. I found that to be true. After changing just the motor, we ordered a board 
changed it. The motor quit working. Um, tech support said I was supposed to change both at the same time. That's why the new motor burned up. Is this true? Um, it is, uh, from my point of view, doing tech support over the phone for you guys out there in the field, um, I always recommend both. Even if we can, you know, know for sure which is which, I always recommend both just in case. Um, that's that's a, a good rule of thumb. Uh, maybe we missed something on, on the phone with you or something like that. I would always get both. Yeah, it's, it's probably not universally true that every time the motor fails, there's a problem with the board. That's probably not universally true. But if the board caused that motor failure, right? Now right. You, want, you want to change both just to just to right. Sure. If we're willing to uh, to send you that board, why not? Right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and can and, it? And with, and with the Vireo Gen Three series, it's a lot easier to get to the board and uh, make that change out. Right. Good. Good point, Keith. You can access the board without um, taking the entire outer cover off, which is a, a it was. It's like they made it just for technicians. <laughs> well, they've probably had enough uh, enough of us talking to them about removing that whole cover and you know all the work that you have to do to get in there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That um, makes it a lot easier. Kenneth is asking, is that filled wiring and piping? I assume uh, yes, yes. We're talking about the filled uh, interconnecting cable and the filled line set um, piping. All right, so. Uh, and one last thing, uh, Gabriel, uh, glad you could join us, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel's our friend out west. Um, just add, uh, an added note, setting the indoor fan speed to low in the heat mode could also possibly cause an E1. Yes, yeah. most certainly. If yeah. you're manually setting it to low speed um, and say you've got some dirty filters, a little bit of buildup on the fan uh, wheel, then you know it, it's not able to ramp up to remove that heat. So yeah. obviously there's a good chance you could get an E1 out of it. Yep, so that system is trying to get rid of heat in cooling mode, it's trying to get rid of it to the outside and heating, it's trying to get rid of it to the inside and uh, anything that restricts that heat transfer could, could possibly pop that uh, E1. Yes. So uh, can a system be overcharged? Uh, what? can happen if the system is overcharged. Well, uh, you could get an E1, which is what we're here to talk about. And uh, what other problems could occur with system overcharging? How about slugging a compressor? It can, oh, yeah. it can happen. It can happen. Uh, there's some misnomers that, uh, and many splits are, are pretty amazing. The way they operate, the way they think, the logic they have in there uh self-adjusting and um, self-diagnosing in some cases but uh it's still a mechanical system that has parameters and uh engineers laid these things out designed it and have these set parameters so you know you should really stick stick to those parameters um overcharge system uh you know can can display higher pressures but um and, and you may see huge increases in pressures in uh, heat mode, but um, all mini splits have an accumulator and you know, some multi-zone systems may have two. This allows the excess refrigerant a place to go when the system slows down. So a couple little slides here. Uh, refrigerant uh, in, the, in the, you know, on the suction line enters the accumulator the accumulator holds the excess refrigerant when the system slows down to low capacity. And they do have a screen in there uh, to help protect it from some debris. And uh, then the suction tubes just below the screen pull vapor uh, from up here and then the, the liquid stays down below. So like little snorkels, right? Um, refrigerant will be in the lower part here. Suction always enters through here. So you've got a little bit of protection. <clears throat> But if it's overcharged, is there a chance that the refrigerant could flow in and go above that screen and then get sucked down into the suction side? Yes. And then, uh, you know, you've got bigger problems than an E1. <laughs> Most certainly. <laughs> okay. So uh, 
system overcharged. A couple ways, you know, you can you can put some gauges on there, uh, check the pressure to see the the if it's a pressure switch, they trip above 600. Um, if it's a sensor, you know, it's it's taking that information, showing it to the board as a resistance value, doing some calculations. They do have some some internal protection. Uh, so the system will slow itself down to try and protect itself. Uh, again, it's, it's desire is to keep running. And, um, you know, we want them to have heating and cooling. It's not going to run indefinitely, though. Uh, if, it, if it finally decides, if it runs long enough and sees a certain condition, then it's going to going to protect itself by uh, shutting down and, and displaying that E1. I had, uh, I, Keith, I had one the other day that uh, it was a, a code, a low pressure code. Um, no, it, the, the result, the end result was low pressure, but the code was reduced frequency for low pressure. So it, it reduces frequency of the compressor and adjusts the EVs to try to continue running, even though it doesn't have the proper charge that it needs to, to continue uh, doing the job that it, that it needs to do. So yeah. pretty amazing. Um, but uh, you can perform a, a temperature differential test of supply and return air. Delta T should be about 20 to 25 uh, in cooling mode, 25 to 30 in heating mode. And you're trying to test as close to where the uh, uh, temperature sensor is, right? The ambient temperature yes. sensor? Yes. So when you're performing your test, try and be as close to those as you can in cooling or the mode. Or the return and supply as close to the actual return and as close to the actual supply as you can get. And then, uh, you know, the only way to really be certain about your refrigerant charge, 100%, I mean, 99.9% .9 certain about your refrigerant charge, uh, is to recover the refrigerant and then weigh it back in uh, according to the factory specifications and any line length that you may have added. Um, the other thing, uh, and Daniel mentioned this this morning, is when you're recovering refrigerant, let's say you're going to pump a system down and, and recharge it. When recovering the charge, weigh it out as yes. well so you can determine if the system was charged correctly. And then, and then you already, you, you, you know what you're dealing with before you even start the evacuation process. Yeah, yeah real good tip. <clears throat> so then next we have temperature sensors. What if you have a bad sensor? Could that cause an E1? Yes. Absolutely, right? And uh, so there's uh, there's five sensors located in the system uh, that can be easily checked for proper function. Um, but like if a sensor was a problem, could it have possibly displayed an F1 or an F2 or one of those F errors first or, you know, an unhappy customer calling you up to say this thing's not working right? So, so sometimes... Uh, you know, you may get another call, but yes, a bad sensor can certainly lead to an E1. Return air temperature sensor is located usually down here in the, um, in the bottom right. You see it uh, located there, the yellow uh, sensor. And then the indoor pipe sensor is up here on the evaporator. And uh, there's a little close-up shot. And, uh, and that, that sensor, you're in heat mode is monitoring how, how hot the indoor coil gets. So if it's not able to remove, uh, remove, uh, remove enough heat, then it could throw the E1 air coat as well um, yeah. because it's sensing that it is uh, over temperature. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's, it's determining the fan speed. Yes. Uh, and it also sends a uh, signal to the control module with other sensor inputs to control the flow of refrigerant through the EEV. Uh, outdoor temperature sensor, and uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Believe it or believe it or not, I've actually had an E1 on a system that was on a roof out in Arizona during the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's not surprising. <laughs> 135 degrees on the roof. Yeah, blistering. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, a couple of things to remember, too, about uh, outdoor ambient sensors is, uh, you know, it's important to locate the system so it senses proper airflow. So consider things like prevailing winds, 
sun exposure, other weather conditions or things that may uh, block accurate readings. Dryer vents. Yeah, dryer vents, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a bush or, you know, being too close to the house, you know, if it's not uh, able to draw the air across there, it's gonna be, uh, it could throw a reading. So uh, then this is the, the condenser coil sensor and, um, you know, senses the temperature there on the right on the pipe and then uh, does calculations in the uh, in the board to figure out what to do with the EEV and all the rest. Discharge uh, temperature sensor, um, it's not a safety switch, sends information to the board and like we say, it'll, uh, you know, speed, it'll slow down a little bit to protect itself if it's sensing a, a high temperature there. Another thing that can occur, and this came from, oops, came from Richard um, in our tech department, but he, he's had situations where um, uh, mud daubers or uh, dirt daubers um, pack mud up inside the plastic portion of this uh, sensor tube here mm -hmm. and throw off the reading through an E1. Uh, they've seen spider webs. Uh, what else? I mean. Yeah, uh, any anything that um, even like some of, not all of the, um, uh, discharge temperature sensors, not all of them are clip-on. Some of them have a little tube that the sensor slides in. And if anything is uh, causing that uh, tube to, to not be um, uh, close to the pipe, uh, spider web or whatever that got in there, it could cause an E1 error code or an er erroneous reading, even though the sensor itself is, is actually ohming out properly. Um, you know, if you're not doing a visual check on the sensor, then, you know, you could have something like this going on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, we've got a suggestion on uh, a way to maybe test these uh, in our tips and tricks section. So uh, testing temperature sensors using an ohmmeter, check the resistance uh, value across the leads. Based on temperature, <clears throat> current temperature, the value should uh, be close to the values on the tables. And um, we just put some updated tables uh, out there for you too to make it a little bit easier. Uh, got an example of that here coming up. Uh, but uh, don't don't forget, Keith. Um, if you if you don't have some needlepoint uh, adapters for your meter, um, go ahead and get some. You're gonna need them one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's it's really hard to get down in those Molex connectors. Yes, um, this makes point. life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I, um, I always mention that too, but uh, temperature uh, sensors. Now these are the board diagrams again, showing you where the sensors are located. You'll see, um, you know, that sometimes I'll have the values in here, 15K, 20K, 50K. They don't show that on the indoor, but uh, ambient temperature sensors are always 15K. Tube sensors, evaporator, condenser are always 20K, and then the discharge uh, sensor is always a 50K. So that, that kind of helps. You'll find the, the diagrams in the service manuals. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the service manual that we create is going to have all this information and Molex connectors and where to put the meters and what readings you should get. We'll have tables for everything. So I'm working on those. Uh, on those now and we hope and, gener have and generally speaking um as you can see in in the previous picture keith the the uh color of the wires going to the sensors uh now this is generally speaking there may be a few different ones um in the older versions but from all of the n current models that i deal with i see the white being the 50k which is yep. the discharge i see the yellow always being the amb ambient sensor and, and it's also the uh, entire wire and the sensor itself uh, seems to be indoor and outdoor ambient is yellow. So it's easy to recognize. And then the, the black wire is the uh, 20, uh, 20K um, coil sensors. And on the multi-zone, you'll see uh, several of the, the black wired uh, 20K sensors on the outdoor. Yeah, yeah, that is that is helpful. So uh, just at a glance, uh, you should be able to tell. So uh, the sensor tables, this this is what we put out there. So this has both Celsius and Fahrenheit, and uh, and that conversion table can come in handy uh, for.
for some of the other tools that we have uh, if you're using a debugger, uh, which we're gonna cover here in a minute. But we've got Celsius, Fahrenheit, all the resistance values for uh, 15K, 20K and 50K all sitting side by side and uh, covers, covers the full range of uh, temperatures for the equipment. And I just, you know, I just have to say, Keith, that's a, a, an excellent table that you've built there. Um, it, can you explain the highlighted portion of it? Uh, that comes up in our tips and tricks. Okay, gotcha. You know, uh, but uh, so then high pressure switch, if the system has a high pressure switch um, and it trips, the entire unit shuts down. Um, this is the description out of the service manual. When outdoor unit detects high pressure, uh, switch is cut off for three seconds successfully, uh, successively, sorry, uh, high pressure protection will occur. Uh, you get the E1. All loads except the four-way valve, which is energized and heating, um, but all loads will be switched off. Uh, the reversing valve will continue to be energized. And in, in this case, all the buttons on the remote, uh, except on and off, will be disabled, cannot be recovered automatically. Switch off the unit and re-energize after cutting off power to eliminate this protection. Well, it, it doesn't eliminate it, it doesn't fix it, right? Cutting off power doesn't solve the problem, it just clears it until the problem displays itself again. Right. So what's your opinion, uh, Daniel, on, on the likelihood of that occurrence happening? So, um, you know, if you just go out there and you pull the power, do a hard reset, wait 10 minutes and it clears the code, um, chances are you're not dealing with a failed pressure switch, correct? Um, but you're going to eventually get another E1 error code, whether it be, you know, uh, after you get home and um, sit down in, you know, your recliner to do your service reports, <laughs> the customer calls you back. Um so, you know, it's, it's important to, to not just reset, to, but to inspect and test everything. Well, would it be uh, beneficial, like they get a call from a customer, hey, I got this unit, it's showing an E1, have the, have the customer cycle power off and turn it back on. And okay, if it happens again, call me. Because then, you know, then you know you're going out there for an E1. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, the board diagram showing you where the high pressure switch is at. If you're curious whether or not a system has a high pressure switch, this is a good way to figure it out. Uh, look at the board diagram. Uh, this thing trips at uh, around over 600. 609, the switch opens. 522, yeah. it closes back. And um, this is where it's located. It's, it's you know, discharge so it's off the uh, compressor discharge line should be pretty easy to find that's what it looks like and um, make sure the switch is connected well at both ends on the board and and the terminals on the switch itself uh, check the system using the gauge pressure is high uh, again you know that 600 range um, you can perform a continuity test on that on that switch just uh, pull the wires off and remove the two spade connectors and put the meter on there and it should uh, show continuity. If it does not, uh, replace the switch. You do have to, uh, uh, well, and, and another test you can do, you can simulate the E1 by removing one of the leads from the high pressure switch, mm -hmm. uh, if that is helpful. And then to replace this switch, uh, cut the zip tie off there, um, remove the insulation from around it, take the wires off, and now you've got to braze it in. So if you're going to replace one of these switches, please use some kind of thermo trap or some type of a heat absorbing uh, compound, a wet rag works fine, but um, uh, make sure to protect that uh, switch and anything else that's, that's around it. We, we don't want to melt it while we're installing it, right? No, that could be problematic. You might get another <laughs> E1. Of course, then it might be welded closed, you know? <laughs> Um, so the, uh, EEV can also be a problem on many splits. The EEVs are located in the outdoor unit and, um, you know, they're going to be on the liquid line just after the strainer slash muffler, um, and before the service valves. 
multi-zone systems will have multiple uh, EEVs in there. And uh, as you can see, they're labeled in there, AB, units AB. And then uh, the, uh, the coils are easy to check and inspect and change if necessary. So the way this thing works is uh, warm liquid is entering in, needle valve rotates um, by the uh, pulsations, um, directional pulsations given to the magnetic coil and uh, spins clockwise to close the needle down, spins counterclockwise to open the valve up. And um, they provide extremely accurate uh, refrigerant flow of 480 steps to be fully open. Zero to 50, they call that fully closed. Uh, but then there's 480 steps for this thing to uh, open, and, open and close within this uh, range here. But you can see it's a real tiny little needle valve and these things close off completely. Uh, at system startup, you'll hear that little ticking sometimes. If you're outside, tick, 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 tick. And that's that valve driving all the way closed before it receives information from the controller and decides uh, how much this needs to open or close. So as you can see from, from the opening there, you know, if, if you forget to, to deburr your flares and a, a piece of uh, copper happens to make it past the strainer, then, you know, you could have a, a blockage there. Couldn't you sure. keep? Yep. Uh, and that's why we don't allow desiccant dryers, mm -hmm. um, brazing without nitrogen, a uh, number of things that can cause, uh, cause problems in here. One tiny little piece of debris can cause that thing to, uh, to stick and, and not function properly. Another thing that can happen, and this is an easy visual inspection, pull that coil off and just take a look inside. Uh, corrosion can develop over time uh, on the inside of the EEV coil. And, you know, environment has a lot to do with it. If you're in a cold, wet, you know, environment, um, or, you know, uh, I guess even uh, some condensation and, and things like that uh, can be problematic. So clean the inside of this thing. If you see it dirty like that, clean it with some fine, uh, fine knot steel wool, clean the post as well. Uh, the magnetic coil transmits the directional pulses to the post, which spins a needle inside the valve, as we saw in the last slide. Uh, if the signal is interrupted, obviously it can, uh, it can cause a problem. Coils are easy to replace. Uh, and a, uh, one, one note on that, you know, after you get it good and cleaned up, Keith, is to use some type of uh, uh, a lubricant um, just to, you know, try to uh, keep corrosion from happening again on it. You can use any type of lubricant and just a thin coat and put it on there. Yep, good point. And um, so here's some other examples that, I mean, you can see these things are pretty crusty in there. Um, you know, clean them up. If they're still not functioning properly, you may have to uh, uh, replace them if they've been installed for, you know, for some time. Uh, the other thing that that can lead to is damage to the PCB. Uh, occasionally, you know, if that moisture is in there, water and electronics don't mix too well, and you could end up with something like this. So uh, just something to, to keep in mind, something to check. If, if you've done the other checks, you know, as you're going down the list, we're getting harder and harder. If you've done the other checks and you haven't fixed the problem yet, then, you know, you got to keep going, and this is, uh, this is the direction to go. So I've like actually... I've actually had several instances where um, a board was replaced and it turned out an EV uh, was shorted and it ended up um, causing damage to the, the new control board. So that's, you know, a good thing to, if you do have, a, you know, a reason to replace a control board, inspect that control board too, just to make sure, okay, it does it have a, a burnt spot. And if it does, um, trace that circuit down just to make sure you don't need to look at other components. Yep. Yeah, yeah, really good point. And uh, so, you know, you can replace the coils very easily. They pop right off there. And then the harness, you know, you can unplug it from the board and uh, fish a new one in there uh, if that's necessary. If you have to replace the, the entire valve, um, again, you've got to braze it in there. And... Um, so this is, uh, this is what the part looks like that you get. And um, again, you know, use some thermal paste or a cloth or something to protect the valve. And flow nitrogen. 
<laughs> and flow nitrogen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so test procedures, uh, temperature differential on the EEV. When system is running, use a digital thermometer to test the input line compared to the output. There should be uh, uh, higher uh, on the input than the output. If they're the same, EEV could be stuck in the open position. A uh, couple of things that you might be able to do to resolve that issue. We're going to cover that in our tips and tricks. Uh, then other testing procedures. So we've, uh, and this is all going to be out there, and again, is going to be in our service manual, but uh, select um, mill ohms on the uh, multimeter and put the lead, the red lead on the uh, uh, metal tab on the bottom of the coil. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the tab that holds it on when you yeah, test it? Okay. Yeah, it makes contact, you know, yeah. it's a, a ground tab basically. But uh, so you put the, uh, the tab there and then um, uh, you can check across any of the uh, pins in the Molex connector. Um, they should, um, and we'll spell this out, you know, in the in the manual. But so it should uh, all be fine or uh, open. Hundred milliohms, yeah, yeah. And then uh, EEV testing. So this is uh, another unpowered test. Select two hundred ohms on the multimeter. Resistance should be uh, 46, you know, plus or minus, uh, 3.6. So somewhere in this range. And, um, uh, this, this gives you the wires to test across and what the reading should be. It, it looks like someone needs some needle point, uh, adapters for their meter on that last picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Um, no question. Yeah. Um, so you can check to see if the, if the, um, Printed circuit board is putting out power to the EEV. The connector here, you just go to the pins four and six. You should get 12 volts DC on those. Now, if you're doing this, you want to be careful because you've got power to the unit, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just don't don't touch anything on the board. <laughs> yeah. Power test. Yeah. That uh, they can bite you. And then, uh, so what about a sticky EEV? You can have huge fluctuations in pressure. Uh, stuck fully open could cause uh, excess cooling, frost on the evaporator. Stuck fully closed will cause, can cause no cooling, uh, warm air in the evaporator, suction pressure nearly equal to standing pressure. Uh, no gas discharge on liquid uh, valve, overheating in the compressor, high discharge temperature. There's our E1. Systems will slow down to protect the compressor though, at least. So uh, we do have an interesting tool. Now, if any of you do not have a greed mini split debugger, um, you may want to consider investing in these. They, uh, they really, oh, here's Daniel's got one. Yep. So um, everybody's jealous. But uh, you can tap onto the system wiring at the indoor or the outdoor unit and uh, test a lot of different system functions. So uh, you can verify sensor readings, verify data using the debugger if E1 occurs and under what conditions, simulate indoor and outdoor unit on the mini splits and then uh, uh, some of the other ones that shows both values. Uh, perform calculation between discharge temperature sensor, condenser sensor, outdoor ambient, it shows you all those values. So this is kind of what it looks like, the uh, display screen and function buttons, the power cord plugs in, and then these terminals connect to the uh, unit. And uh, safety first, power off the unit. Uh, this kind of tells you how to hook it up. Uh, make sure your connections are not crossed or you'll get an E6. And um, uh, again, we're, all this information will be out there for you um, uh, to download on that's that's actually in the manual that comes with the debugger right Keith yeah okay so um, the just to kind of clarify there's the single zone and then the multi-zone debugger the single zone is going to read whichever unit you connect it to such as outdoor or if you connect it to indoor it's going to give you the indoor readings the multi-zone as you can see here in this example is it's going to give you indoor and outdoor readings. So you don't have to run up and down the steps trying to determine if unit A is in high fan speed mode and what the indoor temperature is on it. Yeah. 
And uh, you can see a lot of different values here. Um, it's telling you uh, the operating mode, where the EEV is. It's at the 175th step. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it closed down pretty, you know, fairly tight, right? If zero to 50 is considered closed and 480 is considered fully open. Uh, and uh, the temperatures and, and things are displayed in Celsius. Uh, we're sorry about that, but, uh, you know, that's what we got. And Just keep your <laughs> conversion chart handy. <laughs> keep the conversion chart handy. It's still a fabulous tool to have uh, in your arsenal. Uh, it'll save you so much time and trouble, you know, uh, performing all those checks for you without having to hook up a meter. Um, tells you it's a cassette and, uh, you know, fan speeds, tube temp, um, you know, the whole thing. And then this is the outdoor unit. So this is showing you both, as you can see, like on this last slide, you see all those number of screens that are down there, a lot of different uh, values that it can show you. And then uh, same for this. So this is the outdoor unit state. Uh, it's in heating. And um, these, you can see the EEV, 479, 480, those are fully open. And uh, various temperatures and uh, anything to add? Yeah, yeah the, the, the important thing to me here is that you can you can see what your temperature sensors are reading or, or at least what the system thinks that they're reading. So if they're out of a, a range that you're looking for, then you can go, OK, let me get my meter out of the bag and check that particular sensor just to make sure that it's reading correctly. Right, right. So it's doing a lot of troubleshooting for you, uh, getting you to the right uh uh, how did Dwayne say that? It gets you to the right uh, right street, not necessarily the right address, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but it's it's helping you dial in so that you uh, you know do less work um, fumbling around trying to check everything independently. And uh, so um, showing the readings in uh, in Celsius, I converted them down here, but um, this function. Uh, detects the operating parameters for the whole unit. Um, and this is on the, is this the mini split? This is the single zone one that you were looking at, not the multi zone. So you are able to see, you know, if you're hooked to the um, outdoor unit, you're able to see the outdoor ambient temp that it thinks it is. You know, you can compare that to see if it's correct. Uh, you can see what your discharge temp thinks that it is. Um, compare that, you know, take an accurate reading off of the discharge pipe and see if it's fairly accurate within, you know, plus or minus 10%. And um, so this is a, an example of the mini split one, right? Yeah, yeah, the single zone. So you've got your one, two, three wires hooked up and you can hook up to the indoor or the outdoor um, and read all the parameters from that particular model of or particular unit that you're attached to. Yeah. Yeah. So if you hook it up here, you got to disconnect on the indoor and vice versa. Right? So tips and tricks. Um, we thought of a few things that might be very helpful to you in the field. Um, but again, cycling power, we just kind of wanted to touch on this. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to call back, um, so cycling power and, uh, uh, you know, clearing the E1 is not necessarily a solution to the problem. Right. Uh, you know, just uh, it pays to go through the checks. If you're already out there, it pays to check the, the filters and the coils and, and stuff for cleanliness. And that is the, probably the most common uh, cause. So, uh, and it may clear or not turn back on. Um, uh, talking with Richard too, he said, yeah, he's, he's tried to, um, mimic problems like, um, uh, duplicate, uh, an error code and the systems, because their desire is to run are trying to think around that problem. They're trying to find a way around it. <laughs> yes. so, it so it's hard to get it to duplicate uh, an error. Yeah. Yeah. So, Some, sometimes it, it just, you know, the, uh, I believe it, it goes through, um, not the, not the E1 because the E1 is a safety, but a lot of the codes, it'll go through a series of, 
uh, five to seven times of attempting and seeing if there is a code that comes up before it actually locks out. So, it, you know, it could be occurring at the moment. It's just not locking out yet because it wants to continue providing cooling or heating. Yeah. So um, cleaning filters and coils. Uh, if the filters are dirty, could the coils still need cleaning? Yes. Very much so. Don't. And vice versa, right? And vice versa. The coils are dirty. Filters could need cleaning. Uh, if there are obstructions, would it still be wise to clean and clear everything every time, right? Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that all GRE units come with standard blue fin coating, and some of the outdoor units even have gold fin coating. It's an acrylic resin coating that resists uh, salt spray and corrosion. Uh, it also helps with heat transfer and um, it helps to keep things from sticking to the, to the metal. Um, but uh, you should only use a detergent when you're cleaning these coils. Don't use an acid uh, that could etch away some of that acrylic resin coating. And there's, there's a bunch of different brands out there. This is a Rector Seal product uh, uh, that's, that's been designed for cleaning mini splits. Uh, New Calgon has TriPower. Uh, this is uh, Diversitech Triple D. These are all um, uh, concentrated detergents and they will do a good job at removing some of the dust and dirt and things uh, without damaging that acrylic resin coating. Don't forget the blower wheel. <laughs> and the blower wheel, yeah. yeah. Hey, clean that thing off. <laughs> yeah, I'd pull that out of there and, you know, take it out and clean it. But uh, uh, this is what the dissolve uh, kit looks like from Rector Seal for cleaning the indoor coils. It's got a bib. Um, and there's, there's some other uh, kits out there similar to this, but uh, the bib, you know, helps to contain this uh, runoff from this down into the bucket. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good tool for- uh, Keep from making it. such a mess. Yeah, yeah. Either that or take the unit off the wall and take it outside. Yeah. <laughs> And then you're going to charge the system again. And all. Yep. So, um, uh, one thing we thought of for sensor measurements, um, if, you, if you can get a glass of ice water to the lead, to, to the end of that sensor, um, ice water is always 32 degrees. So now you don't have to worry about having your temperature chart. You only have to remember three values, right? Because if you're always testing at 32 degrees, now I only need to remember 49 for a 15K, 65, and 161 uh, for a 50. Uh, that way, um, doesn't matter what the ambient temperature is, uh, you don't, you're always going to be accurate. So whether it's hot or cold outside, you know, let's say it's colder than 32 outside. When you put that down in the ice water, it's, it's going to still take it to 32. And so you're always going to know that you've got a stable reading, a stable temperature anyway, right. um, that you're putting the, uh, the sensor in. The, the environment's always going to be the same. And then uh, just, you know, commit those to memory, have them on your phone, a little picture of that or whatever. And then you don't have to remember all, you know, 800 different uh, values or, or you don't, you're not uh, married to the chart. Uh, Four-point temperature check. Uh, this is what Daniel talked about earlier. And uh, Yeah, I'd, I'd like to explain a little bit more about that four-point temperature check. It, it, it sounds confusing, and it sounds a little confusing when you try to explain it over the phone. Um, so what we're saying there is that you're taking the temperature of one copper line, not the line set. You're taking the temperature outside as close to the service valve as you can get and inside as close to the manifold of the indoor coil as you can get. Sometimes that would mean removing the outer shell of the indoor unit so you can see the coil and everything if you can't get to the back of the unit where the line sets come out, but it's close to that manifold where it enters the indoor coil. Those two temperatures should be almost the same within three to five degrees of each other, indoor and out. If that is true, then there's no restriction in between the indoor and out in that particular pipe. Very good. Very uh, helpful tip. Uh, so talking about that sticky EEV, 
these are permanent magnet, uh, EEV magnets, and um, and there's two sizes uh, because there's a couple different sizes of these um, uh, um, the body on the um, EEV valve itself. Mm -hmm. So these are designed to fit, you know, just around those nicely, and uh, you can use these things to turn that piston inside there, just like a just like turning on a faucet, opening and closing the faucet. And sometimes if there's a piece of debris or something that's uh, preventing or causing that thing to stick, you can spin those EEV magnets and loosen that up and uh, maybe free that up. That would be a lot better for me than having to replace this and braze a new one in there. Yes, most certainly. And, and also it, it's good as a test tool to see if your uh, EEV motor is actually moving it or not, or if it's stuck. Yeah. Yeah, you could open it up uh, fully and just and listen for that thing to drive down and then open back up again. When you power it up, they drive fully closed and then mm -hmm. they'll they'll reopen. So uh, might be a good idea to cycle that all the way open. But that's it makes a real easy method for doing that. So just to recap, um, we we covered eleven different things here. Uh, Outdoor ambient too high. Uh, we've got charts out there for you. Are the service valves fully open? Easy thing to check. Dirty filters and coils, probably the most common thing. Again, easy visual check and uh, uh, should always be done. Is the stepper motor functioning properly? Indoor fan, condenser fan. Uh, is the system overcharged or is it low on refrigerant? And then are the sensors functioning properly? Uh, if it has a pressure switch, is that functioning properly? Uh, easy to check, not as easy to change, is the EEV functioning properly. So all these steps should be things that can get you in the right, uh, you know, in, in the right uh, area to fix that problem, hopefully fix it quickly, like in the early stages of that list. Excellent. So uh, tech support. Tech support department does have some requests. I'll let you go through those. Please, please help us help you. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't know what you're working on, then we can't help you. Um, when you're reaching out to us, please, if you're sending an email to tech support at twclimate.com or if you're calling us um, on the 888-850-7928 number, please be sure to have your model and serial number ready. Um, and your company name. Let us know you're a contractor so that we can get back with you as quickly as possible. Don't forget to leave your phone number um, and a, a brief explanation of the problem, such as, hey, I've got an E1 error code, I need help. Um, and that helps us uh, go ahead and, and get the service manual pulled up for the correct model. Um, and that way we can get back to you a lot quicker and, and get you the help that you need. Yep. And, uh, Please, uh, please be sure to check on the uh, uh, greecomfort.com site and uh, look at those quick tip videos. We're going to add those all the time. And hopefully when you do have a problem, you can go check and see if there's a quick tip video on it. It, it might just help solve your problem. Um, other pieces of information that we're going to put out there and eventually uh, a phone app so you can have it right there in your pocket. You can diagnose uh you know, error codes, uh, uh, piping rules, and, um, you know, submittals will be out there and just a variety of different things right there at your fingertips. And, uh, and, and don't forget that the QR code uh, on, the, on the newer uh, models on the outdoor near the data plate, you scan that QR code and it takes you to the quick tip videos and keeps adding quick tip videos all the time. And uh, so you can just scan that take you to the quick tips and hopefully uh, get the problem resolved as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And uh, don't forget about our social media sites, uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, we're going to, we're going to uh, push some more YouTube videos out there uh, as we go, but uh, we're just starting our training season now. And um, uh, hopefully we'll see you guys out there somewhere. Uh, training class near you. If you're not already a Gree Select dealer, please attend one of those classes and we'll get you signed up as a Gree Select dealer. There's a lot of perks uh, that come along with that. Uh, no cost to you, just uh, just your time. So uh, 
we appreciate you guys very much. So uh, did any other questions come in while we were? Yeah, we, we had a few questions come in, Keith. Um, the uh, Scott uh, is asking the new service manuals, how soon can we expect them to be available? <laughs> Ooh, um, so the, the new service manual is kind of a culmination of all the materials that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've put a, um, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> I, I put Next a date week. out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I put a date out there to Suzanne the other day of, uh, of April. Um, excellent. So excellent. So, so that's, that is, that is excellent. Um, right as we're going into, in the uh, cooling season, getting into the busy season. So um, look forward to some uh, more detailed information. You know, that's, that's a lot of what we've been missing. Um, and it's, it's a matter of uh, Richard's hard work and, and your hard work and, and the team's hard work to, to uh, find test points on control boards and determine, you know, what the value should be and, and, you know, looking at testing motors and things like that, that we've been lacking on in the past. But changing that is going to, I feel like that's going to make the contractor's job so much easier to be able to have at his fingertips the, the test points. What, what do I need to test on this control board? So looking forward to that, Keith, and I'm glad you're um, here to help us get that uh, changed. Um, Another question uh, from Alan was, where do we get the, uh, a debugger from? That's an excellent question. Um, reach out to your local sales rep um, and they can get you uh, uh, the part number and place an order through your local distributor for the, for the debuggers. There's, there's three different ones. Uh, one's the single zone 115 volt model. One's the two, uh, single zone 230 volt model. And one is the multi-zone uh, debugger model. So troubleshooting tools, I mean, that's what we want to try and put in your hands. And uh, uh, we also have uh, on the website, the Zendesk and um, uh, Daniel and Richard and other people have been adding a lot of material to that. And uh, so there's, there's really good information there as well. Uh, some of that I scraped out and, and used for this presentation as well. So uh, keep an eye on that. How do they access that? Um, so all you have to do is reach out to the tech support team and we can send you the, the troubleshooting that we've built. So we'll send you a link with, um, for instance, the E1. Uh, we can send you the link uh, to the rundown of the E1 so you can see it in, uh, in an email. Yeah, perfect. So any other questions? Um, looks like uh, Sam Brewer's got a question. Looks like he's talking about um, pre-insulated line sets. Uh, moisture between the foam and the copper was uh, forming corrosion, eating holes in the line sets. Um, have you seen anything on this? I, I have had a couple of instances where I've heard about something like that, but it's, you know, that's something that's um, uh, manufacturer related to the line sets itself. Uh, we don't, um, Gree doesn't manufacture line sets, so it's not something that I've looked into or seen myself. Have you, Keith? Uh, I, I've heard of it over the years, uh, here and there, uh, formicary corrosion, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether it's the insulation itself, mm -hmm. um, you know, the rubber type insulation or, uh, or others, but uh, insulating the lines uh, for us. Uh, you insulate both lines, and especially for the indoor portion of that, most of that's to carry condensation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any condensation that forms, and so uh, so there is going to be moisture there. But um, yeah, I, I don't uh, I don't know a solution to that. Yeah, he was saying that um, uh, seal the the ends of the insulation with some tape, which seems like a good idea. I think any any moisture that's um, kind of in a place where it shouldn't be, uh, it could be an issue. So, um, and then Scott was asking about, can you tell us more capabilities of the upcoming app that you're talking about? Yeah, so the, uh, the app, I'm not a code writer. Um, so it's, it's uh, fairly simple. 
uh, but it will be useful information, like I say, uh, if you're trying to find an error code or a submittal or piping rules or um, technical information, hopefully, and, and it'll have links to the website and, mm -hmm. you know, catalog and, uh, and various other things as well, maybe even our service manual, you know, that type of thing. Um, and, and some of those you'll be able to access without an internet connection. So if you have the app on the phone, you can pull it up and some of those pages will be accessible and you can blow them up, you know, so you can read, like if it's smaller print, you can blow them up and, and read the values and things. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and, and if, if we, um, I'm, like I say, I'm not a, de a developer and a code writer and things like that. So, so my capabilities are going to be fairly limited as far as what I can uh, put out there. It's going to be excellent. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be but, amazing. <laughs> but, uh, but there's other tools in there. And as we dig deeper, if we can find somebody who's more knowledgeable than me, on you know, building, even, even the simple things such as the, uh, the ohm chart that you created and yeah. just to put that on the phone, the phone app. So, you, you know, if you're out there testing sensors, you know, push a button and there you have uh, what you should be reading. Right. So that's, that's really useful. Um, a few other questions. Uh, Elliot Ross is, is asking, um, he has a Vireo 36K every winter. Um, he's getting an E1 code, pulled and weighed charge, uh, check the pressure switch and sensors, resetting. It runs days, even weeks before an E1. Any suggestions? Um, you know, I, I would have to say, uh, Elliot, reach out to the tech team. And, and be happy to go through all of the checks that we went over here on the on the uh, webinar today and and go over those in depth uh, while you're on the job site um, with a with a tech on the phone um, and also pictures pictures of your indoor unit your outdoor unit your wiring um, a lot of times like we were saying in the beginning the interconnecting cable being uh, possibly damaged frayed or something like that. Um, I've even seen an interconnecting cable that's brand new be a problem because there was a problem with the manufacturing of the wire. Um, th there's a lot of different things that it can be. Like we said early on, it's just a symptom, right, Keith? So yeah. we've, we've got to, you know, from, from start to finish, what can I roll out? And then what's left um, that I can check or, or you know, change? Um, Rarely have I seen a control a control board be an E1, um, but I'm not going to say never. <laughs> so um, thanks, Elliot. Yeah, please, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you with that. Um, Scott says, great information. And then Kevin says, does the multi-zone debugger also take care of the single zone or do we need to purchase both units? Um, so the, the multi-zone will only hook up to a multi-zone because it plugs directly onto the control board. The single zone, however, will um, work with a multi-zone. In other words, you can hook it up to one uh, indoor circuit for the multi-zone system um, to read that one circuit. But you wouldn't be able to read indoor and outdoor and not have to run up and down the steps with the single zone. So... And that looks like um, all of it. Uh, let's see. Um, Sam Brewer, can you elaborate a little bit on the flex unit systems? I think they are non-communicating as well. He, he's correct. Right, Keith? Yep. Yeah, so the flex systems use 24-volt uh, thermostat, heat pump thermostat. <clears throat> and... Uh, and that's a good thing because uh, it allows you to then use that inverter outdoor unit with uh, a furnace and an A-coil. And um, we have um, outdoor unit and approved A-coils that meet certain SEER ratings. And then uh, as long as the blower characteristics for the furnace fall within a certain range, then uh, you're supposed to, be, supposed to be able to use anybody's furnace with it. And... Um, and or you can use the air handler that comes uh, with the system. Minus 22 Fahrenheit heating, um, just amazing technology. It's really, really awesome stuff. And um, inverter split system is gonna be a big thing. 
I'm excited about the flex. Everybody across from one coast to the next is talking about it. Um, and I've got a few installed myself, really excited about the product and looking forward to uh, uh, more and more people um, getting interested in, in learning more about it. Um, and then we've got a couple more questions. Looks like we're about out of time. We'll wrap it up. Um, Wayne, is there a debugger for the UMAT range? Um, at this time, uh, we don't have a debugger for the UMatch, but we are working on it. Um, and then, uh, Vincent, uh, why do you make so many different models of high wall indoor unit, uh, Levo, Vireo, et cetera? Um, Keith, why do we make so many models? <laughs> it just has to do with sear ratings and yes. capacities and temperature range, you know, temperature operating range and that kind of thing. So they're always chasing the the highest sear rating possible <clears throat> mm -hmm. sapphire series 38 sear on the 9000 btu minus 22 fahrenheit heating it's amazing you know technology but then you know not everybody lives there most people are kind of in that 23 or 16 sear range some people want a price point you know so we, we kind of have to have all of it makes good sense all right well that looks like all we've got for today keith um Thank everybody for joining us today. It's, it's been uh, good to go over the E1 again, especially during heating season. Yep. Yeah, thank you guys very much for your time. We appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to bringing you some new information uh, next time around. And uh, please, please keep an eye on the website because we're going to push a lot of information out there for you to hopefully help you out. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, have a good day. Thanks a lot.